Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for joining me on my Connect with the CEO live event. My name is Joanne Conroy, and I'm President and CEO of Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health. Today, we are going to discuss diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. We have focused on this effort at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health, and I have two great guests here today. You know, we were talking about this right before we went live, and as when I go to national meetings, people are very familiar with diversity, equity, and inclusion. But we've added belonging because we believe belonging is one of the most important aspects of having an inclusive environment. And we've got two great people that will come talk to us about that. So later on in our conversation, we're gonna speak via Zoom with all the magic of technology with Fallon Tracker, PhD, who's a consultant with Cook Ross. Cook Ross is a nationally known firm that is partnering with us to help us with our DEIB efforts. But first, joining me here in the studio is Dr. Sue Mooney. She is president and CEO of Alice Peck Day Memorial Hospital, and she volunteered to lead our DEIB task force and now is sitting on our system DEIB steering committee. So thank you, Sue, for joining us yeah. today. Thanks a lot for having me. So talk a little bit about why diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is so important. There are probably some people out there that don't get it. Yeah, I think you know there's so many ways to answer that question, but I, I would start with our patients and uh, our mission. You know, we're here uh, really to, to improve the health and the well-being of the people in our communities. And that uh, pi patient population is becoming increasingly diverse. Uh, and we need to be able to meet their needs. I think our workforce is becoming increasingly more diverse. And we need to be able to mobilize our workforce around that common goal. You know, we've done an incredible amount of work in the last year or so. Uh, we started with the task force. Uh, just to really look at what is the landscape uh, of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging in our system. And we've learned so much over the last year and a half. Um, we've uh, been working with our colleagues at Cook Ross to launch a, a real uh, effort around this, a strategy and a listening. We're working on hiring a vice president of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. We've launched the employee resource groups. Uh, we've got so many people energized around these topics. It's just absolutely fantastic. Uh, even at my place, I've got a little frontline organization, uh, a, a group working, and people are really energized by this. Yeah. They're excited. You know, I agree. It is, um, <clears throat> it's something once you dig into, you understand all the complexities of it. And we've learned a lot about our organization. You know, I think we were using older demographic data. And for example, when you um, talk about people of Asian descent, there's a whole group of different um, variables that you, know, you need to consider. You could be Pacific Islander, you could be Chinese, you could be Korean, and all of those have different cultures, different, um, kind of expectations, different holidays, different things that we all need to be sensitive to as an organization. And I know that part of this effort was really identify where we weren't contemporary right. and kind of bring that up to speed. Right. You know, I think that the people that care about it the most are probably our young workers. What do you think about that? I, I totally agree with you and I think the world is is changing and you know, young folks today are I think growing up in a much more fluid environment than mm -hmm. I certainly grew up in, uh, you know, with more uh, of a multi-racial, multi-ethnic, there are people with gender fluidity and sexual orientation fluidity. We've got people serving in the military. We've got folks with disabilities. And I, I think young people, are they're just much more comfortable with mm -hmm. this wide spectrum of human experience. And mm -hmm. they, 
expect to encounter that in their workforce and they want to see that we value all sorts of different peoples. I tell, I tell folks at my organization there's lots of different ways to be human and we need to really respect all of those different ways and, and learn from each other. Uh, and I think it's young people who are teaching us that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, Dwayne Compton, the dean of the medical school, would say that the medical students are driving a tremendous amount of the energy behind their DEI efforts at Geisel School of Medicine. Um, what do you think we are seeing in our new hires? Are, are they asking different questions or, um, you know, how are they introducing this when they come into the workplace? I think it, it really does depend on the age group, right? Mm -hmm. The younger folks, I think it, it, not only is this a, a topic that they want to, to engage with, they want to be engaged at work in general, mm -hmm. right? They, they don't want to just sort of come to work and do their job. They have an expectation that we see uh, the whole person and that uh, understanding and appreciating their background, their, you know, where they came from, what's important to them, that's all an expectation of us as employers. Mm -hmm. So I see this as really a huge piece of our engagement strategy, and our engagement strategy is really the key to our workforce of the future. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting when we were talking um, at a meeting last week, they were um, talking about the fact that employees had to self-identify. And I think a lot of our younger employees are much more comfortable self-identifying not only their race, their sexual preference, their um, ethnic origins. They, um, they have a, a much greater level of comfort with that. And for us to really understand and really meet the needs of our employees, we're going to have to know a lot more about them than we did historically. Right. But I think it's an opportunity to engage with them as well. Yeah. So it was interesting. There was a woman in the group who was from Hawaii. And um, if you were from multiple ethnic backgrounds, you were called cosmopolitan, which I thought oh, was very great. interesting. Yeah, I think it's a typical great. Hawaii thing, but I thought, yeah. I wonder how that would work in the Upper Valley. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so, that's interesting. So you've invested a lot of time and effort in this work. It's like on top of your day job, <laughs> right. so, which I thank you for. Right. But why is this work important for you personally? I, you know, I think it's, it's important personally and it's important professionally. I, I really do see this as strategically imperative for our health system uh, to be successful into the future. Um, but, you know, in terms of the personal, I, it's, I come from a different background. And so, you know, having grown up uh, in an era when the LGBT community did not self-identify, mm -hmm. in fact, we hid, mm -hmm. um, you know, watching this transformation where I can be very out as a gay woman, mm -hmm. um, that's incredible to me yeah. to see that much change in such a short period of time. Uh, and then to have kids who come from a different uh, cultural background, have brown skin, um, I want to make a better world for them. And I believe it's possible because I know it's been a better world just in my lifetime for the LGBT community. Yeah, it is amazing um, <clears throat> how far we've come in a short period of time. However, I don't think we can ignore the fact that for 30, 40 years, people were working hard the change was just incremental early on, and we're just seeing the observable changes right. in our society and in our culture right, right. now. But right. we, believe me, there's been work going on for years. Yes. So we all yes. know that. Yep. Um, I do want to remind the viewers that if you have any questions, please comment on this video, and we can answer your questions live. Um, also, the employees can email belonging at hitchcock.org to join resource groups or get involved in a bunch of our DEIB efforts. So last question before we turn to Fallon. Um, what have you learned so far in this journey regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? Oh, we've, we've learned so much. Uh, and I think one of the big takeaways for me is just how many um, caring, compassionate, good people work across this system. 
uh, and the energy around this uh, is really, really amazing. And it's just such a great way to connect with people. Um, and I think the, the, the counterweight to that is just how much work there is to do mm -hmm. um, to really achieve what we aspire to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, but we got great people working on it and uh, I'm really energized by the, the next steps. Well, thank you, and thank you for all of your efforts. It's um, um, obviously a passion of yours, and it just enriches the entire health system. Mm, thank you. Now we're going to welcome via Zoom Fallon Thacker, who's a consultant with Cook Ross. She is an educator and an author, and specializes in working with organizations on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts. And I'm excited that she it has been partnering with our team. Fallon, can you share with us a little bit about Cook Ross and tell us about our partnership? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, just wanted to say thank you so much for having me here today on behalf of Cook Ross, Dr. Conroy. Um, yeah, so Cook Ross is a black woman owned a full service consulting firm with 30 plus years of experience addressing inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility in the workplace. And we partner with organizations like DHH to better understand the current enablers and barriers in workplace culture and to identify opportunities to transform cultures that meet tomorrow's challenges. In our way at Cook Ross of co-creating solutions and connecting with clients and employees and organizations allow people to shift the way that they show up for work every day. And the project that Cook Ross has partnered with DHH on is what we call a current state assessment. And this project is being co-led by myself and my colleague, Dr. Kendra Kavler. The goal of this current state assessment is to assess and evaluate the organization's diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts and readiness. In post-assessment, Cook Ross will collaborate with selected stakeholders at the, in the organization to devise an organizational DEIB strategy that will be informed by the current state assessment that will ultimately guide the next two to three years of DHH's DEIB efforts. And in order to develop that strategy, Cook Ross will collect various sources of data, both qualitative and quantitative, over the next few months. And I'll you know, take a moment to describe what some of those data sources um, will include, because this will be a way to also um, understand how employees can be engaged in helping us achieve um, the results through the, this current state assessment. And so the first thing that we're doing and we're, that's currently underway, and I've had the pleasure of working um, with Dr. Mooney and the DEIB um, working group on, is a programmatic review. And we're currently reviewing policies and procedures and other items that help us better understand the infrastructure and how the infrastructure operates at DHH. And we want to understand how the infrastructure of DHH impacts all employee groups and particularly culturally diverse employee groups. We'll also be conducting a DEIB engagement survey. And this is where we will survey all employees that are employed across the system and collect information on employee experiences related to social identity and DEIB experiences. And we know that DHH is already engaged in the Press Ganey survey to understand employee engagement. And what our survey will do, it will give us the opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into the specific DEIB needs across the system. We'll also be conducting interviews. And here we will interview select DHH leaders who are responsible for championing the DEIB efforts across the system. We'll talk with them about their experiences as it relates to DEIB and being a leader at DHH. And also we'll get into what their challenges and their successes has been too with leading the DEIB efforts in the organization. And then we'll move to um, taking the opportunity to really listen to employees through two different types of groups. 
And the first one is going to be focus groups. And this is where we will ask for volunteers to talk with us in small groups about their DEIB experiences and what it means to be an employee at DHH. And this will be an invitation available to all DHH employees across the system, but we will only be able to accommodate a portion of the population and we'll make every effort to include as many individuals as possible. And then lastly, we'll be conducting some listening tours. And this is an opportunity to talk with some strategically selected groups who are already engaged in some sort of DEIB work across the system. Um, you know, you all were talking about the medical students earlier. And so, you know, we, this is an opportunity where we want to hear from those groups who are really driving, you know, some of that energy and the change that's already happening with the organization. And we'll talk to them in more of a SWOT analysis format, which is a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats conversation as it relates to DEIB. So I know I just shared a lot about what we'll be doing in this project over the next several months. Um, and But all of this information that we find will be synthesized into a final findings and recommendations report. We then will take those findings and recommendations, we'll present them to a group of leaders and stakeholders, and then we'll come together for what we call a strategy lab. And during the strategy lab, we work with leaders to identify the DEIB priorities that DHH will want to focus on over the next two to three years based on all the data we collected and what we learned from the assessment. And ultimately, this will all culminate into our final deliverable for the project, which is the two to three year DEIB strategy roadmap. <clears throat> well, thanks, Fallon. A couple of questions. Um, you know, we really were very interested in having you um, be our partner because of a couple of things. Number one, just the um, kind of grassroots approach you take, frontline staff mm -hmm. engaged, and um, really your kind of history of working successfully with a number of organizations. Um, that was something that some of the other firms we looked at actually didn't have. It was much more of a top down. Mm -hmm. Um, this is mm -hmm. probably a lot more intensive, but we think it's probably a lot more enduring. But when you come into organizations like ours, you probably see everything. And so what is it about mm -hmm. organizations that actually help them be successful in creating an inclusive environment? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, many leaders um, believe and see the value now more than ever, that having an inclusive culture and environment where everyone feels like they can belong is critical. And however, leaders don't always know how to achieve that, that transformation. And so some fundamental characteristics of an inclusive environment, you know, one is an environment that is equity centered, meaning the infrastructure of an organization including the policies and procedures within an organization are designed and operationalized to ensure that employees have the same degree of equitable access to the tools, resources, and commitments that impact their experience within the organization. And secondly, a human-centered environment is so critical. And a human-centered environment is Achieved when employees feel like their personal characteristics and their identities are valued and reflected in the workplace. And some of these examples of, of human-centered environments are environments where you ha may have lactation rooms for nursing mothers, prayer rooms that recognize various religious space, you know, family leave, you know, et cetera, things like that. And third, in an inclusive environment, there has to be a commitment from leaders. And research tells us that the behaviors of leaders can significantly impact the degree to which an employee feels included in the workplace. It's an intentional and thoughtful process that requires leaders to adapt to the environment to meet the needs of employees and patients around them. And feeling and observing these behaviors drives one's experience of feeling included and, belong and belonging in the organization. And that can be said for both employees and patients. So and have, lastly, an inclusive and in, oh. go ahead, Fallon. 
Okay. Yeah. Just one more, you know, part want to um, add here and an inclusive environment, you know, it ultimately empowers their employees and all the characteristics that, you know, that I shared in describing an inclusive environment, again, ultimately create that experience in which employees are empowered. And also what we know from research is that when employees are engaged and satisfied at work, it will increase the likelihood that patient satisfaction will be higher too. And that's the win-win scenario for a healthcare organization. So we do have a question from one of our viewers who said, how can okay. community members, non-DHH employees, be helpful in your efforts to improve DEIB and support your recruitment and retention efforts? So Fallon, what have you seen in other organizations when they reach outside their organization for community partners, and then Sue, if you want to say what ideas you think we have in our community. So Fallon, first. Yeah, that's a great question, and I love that question because we um, completely understand in working with you all as a healthcare system that, you know, you're serving the community and impacting the community by much of the work that you do. And actually, we're already in conversation um, with Dr. Mooney and our project team about how we can talk to community members and potentially have one of our focus groups um, be focused on some patients and community members that are really invested um, in uh, the DEIB efforts that we're working on. And so it's already something that's been brought to our attention at Cook Ross. It's something we're interested in and something we'll continue to work with the project team on. And that's, you know, what we've done is really relied on the members of the organization that are working with us to really help us bridge those connections and create the right spaces for us to be able to talk with those in the community that are invested in this work. Yeah, I know that Hypertherm is really focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really social justice. And so they are just one example of a, probably a really great community partner. Sue, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to say a lot of uh, the, the companies in our local area are working mm -hmm. on this as well. And I, I do think we have to uh, think beyond the walls of our organizations and look at the communities um, because we can recruit folks from diverse backgrounds to our organization, but if they encounter a, a community that's not welcoming, they're not, they're not likely to stay. Um, so it really is, I think, going to require a, a, an effort uh, among a, a lot of different organizations, and I think those partnerships and connections are going to be really, really important as we move forward with this work. So there's another question from a viewer about showing authentic commitments to DEIB efforts. You know, I, I, I think organizations have um, been under scrutiny if people felt like it was a checklist or if it was a um, check the box or do a perfunctory commitment but never really have an authentic commitment to DEIB. Um, Sue, I'll have you answer that first. Like, what does that look like? And then Fallon, to have you tell us what's going on at organizations across the country that are really making an authentic commitment to DEIB. Sue? Yeah, I, I think it's such a great, uh, it's such a great question. And I, I think at the end of the day, it's got to be actions and not words. And so um, I think we have to, um, really change some of the things that we're doing in terms of policies and procedures uh, that, as Fallon said, you know, create a, a lack of equity in mm -hmm. access. And so I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to what are the actions that you're taking. Mm -hmm. um, and we've taken some tangible actions, like the employee resource groups, uh, like the, the frontline task force at my organization, uh, and there's more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know Sally Craft is doing a lot with data collection because you've got to have the data so that you can uh, start to stratify your health outcomes by uh, race and ethnicity. Yeah. Um, but it's got to be actions and not just words. Yeah, there seem to be two buckets of activity. It's, it's employee focus, which is DEIB and engagement in the workplace. But then there's health equity, Correct. which is a whole different... Bucket. Right. Um, they're related, but 
not necessarily the same. They right. probably feed off the same data set, but one is right. on employees and one is for patients. Right. And actually, both of those data sets are undergoing um, contemporary modifications right. to bring the um, ethnic groups um, up to kind of speed with the, what everybody is actually right. the the terminology, the terminology that people are using right. across the country. Yeah. And we were actually not contemporary with that. No, not at all. So Fallon, as you travel across the country, um, you know, when you see somebody that's really committing to this authentically, what does that look like for you? Yeah, it's such a great and, and timely question. And, you know, in addition to those tangibles that, you know, Dr. Mumia was describing um, that are already illustrating that authentic commitment, you know, I would say another um, area where DHH is already illustrating that commitment is by our partnership here at Cook Bras, um, because that this is requiring um, the organization to invest time, the financial capital, and the people resources to make this partnership happen and to engage in this current state assessment. And throughout this project, you know, we are going to work with leaders to establish a clear DEIB vision and strategy. And there's really four areas that I'd like to just highlight that, you know, will continue to um, illustrate that authentic commitment, which is really going to be driven um, in the strategy implementation process once we have delivered the final strategy in a few months. And one is that it has to be leader-led and driven. Um, we are already seeing the evidence of that at DHH, but it must continue to be a top-down initiative um, that, you know, when organizations, leaders are modeling and prioritizing um, DEIB efforts at the top, this is where we see the momentum continues and the momentum can get lost if it's not otherwise led by leaders. And two, it has to be intentional. And, you know, organizations have to identify and utilize accountability measures to support both the culturally diverse patients that you serve, as well as the employees as a means of recruiting and retaining both groups that are critical to the success of the system. And third, it has to be authentic. You know, um, that's the, that is the nature of this question. But these commitments ultimately create a culturally responsive approach um, to care that you can provide to patients. And what that means is, is a culture in which you're able to tap into the needs of a diverse population that you serve. And research shows that's done well when you have a diverse staff that reflects who your patients are, but who also feel like they are included and belong to an organization. And lastly, it has to be sustainable. Um, that authentic commitment means, again, those tangible opportunities, and they have to be created, and they have to be ongoing. And there has to be those um, ongoing opportunities for employees and patient engagement in the various DEIB initiatives and leveraging their feedback that will influence and impact the experiences of the diverse populations that the system um, both serves and employs. Those are both great answers. You know, it's interesting, you know, people are so busy sometimes. And our next question is, how can employees get involved in the effort to make it more diverse and inclusive? And, um, you know, it kind of probably runs a gamut from kind of people participating in employee resource groups that are being formed and they are really self-organized around, you know, um, characteristics of the group that they self-identify and they've been incredibly successful. I would say in other organizations where people are really busy, sometimes they're really concrete things mm -hmm. that people are asked to do. It was fascinating. One was a, um, a woman from Oregon who said that um, she would have faculty or attendings actually walk down certain hallways and just reflect on how welcoming did that feel to somebody that wasn't from their background to almost just take a critical eye, which is a pretty simple thing to do, to ask somebody to do, but just take a critical eye to see what are the welcoming signs and what are the signs that aren't very welcoming as they walk through an entrance or a major hallway um, in the organization. And she said, that's a way for everybody to really contribute to being very sensitive, but also reflective about 
what does that physical plant, what do the attitudes of the employees actually say about the organization? So I don't see any other questions. I, I just want to remind employees that they're encouraged to learn more about and join our DEIB efforts. And they can um, just write to belonging at hitchcock.org to say, I'd love to be involved. And we'll certainly use everybody's energy and insight. Um, I want to thank both of my guests, Sue Mooney and Fallon Thacker, for joining me today. Uh, I look forward to continuing our DEIB conversations and providing updates on the great work being done. I think Fallon and Sue, the work continues. I know we've just started doing the um, executive forums and we've got many more things planned through the fall. So um, stay tuned for more updates on where we are and where we're gonna go. So great, thank you both yeah, thank so much you. for your time today.